Today I'm going to cover some of the basics of software testing. Now, one type of test you may know already quite well is unit test, but there are actually a couple of other types of tests that you can run that are maybe less obvious to you. So I'll talk about them today. It's a pretty generic video, so I won't touch much upon Python specific libraries. I'm going to cover those topics in more detail in the future though, so stay tuned. Before we start, I have something for you. It's a guide to help you design better software. It's available at ariamcodes.com slash design guide. It consists of seven steps. It's pretty short and to the point so you can apply it immediately to the things that you're working on and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes that I made in the past. So you can get it for free at ariamcodes.com slash design guide. Now let's talk about software testing. Software testing is the process of verifying that a software application is working as expected. If you set up your tests properly, it gives you insight into the quality of your software. It also provides an objective view on your software that developers can rely on whenever they need to make decisions about how to improve the software. There are different types of tests, different levels of tests, different views on testing. And I'll try to cover a few of those things in this video. But before I start, let's first talk about what tests are not. Tests are never a guarantee that your program is correct. Edsger Dijkstra, Dutch computer scientist, we're not related. He once said, program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. Let's take a look at an example that illustrates this. Here's a very simple example of a function with a few tests. Note, I'm not using any testing framework here because in this video, I'm covering testing more in general. I'm going to talk later on in future videos about a few different testing frameworks, such as uh, the built-in unit test one by Python, but also, for example, PyTest and compare the two to give you an idea of what you can do with them. Now, the function that we're testing here is add three, which is a really basic function. It's basic for a reason, because I'm going to use it to explain a couple of uh, ideas in testing. Add three does one simple thing. It takes an input integer, it adds three, and then it returns that integer. And then here I'm writing a few assertions to test that the function is working correctly. So when I run this, obviously I get all tests pass. And if I would change this to something else, then of course these asserts, they're going to fail. So let me just change this back so that this is correct again. There's another way I could write this function. Let's make an alternative. So this also takes an int and it returns an int, but I'm doing it like this. like so. And now let me change the names here. There we go. And now when I run this, of course, also the tests pass. But obviously, this is not how you would implement an add free function because it doesn't work for anything else that we're testing it with. If I were to add another test here with number four, then of course, it was going to fail. But that's also where the crux lies with tests not being able to prove that a program is correct. Because obviously we wouldn't consider this function correct because it's not. But the only way if I had tests to, to prove that is to just add more and more tests. But for every test, I could in principle add an if statement here to also cover that case. And you could say that, well, okay, if you have an infinite number of if statements uh, and an infinite number of tests that test all the values, then you might actually be able to prove it's correct, but that's still not true because then you're not taking into account side effects. For example, what I could do is break the test system by adding a random number generator that gives me a different result only on a very specific date and time. For example, on June 8, which happens to be my birthday. So then most of the times the tests are going to pass except on my birthday. And that in short means that tests basically can never be a guarantee that a program is correct because you're testing a finite number of cases and you don't know anything about side effects. But what if you want to actually prove that a program is correct? Can you do that? Well, actually, yes, you can. It's possible using Hoare logic. And when I say Hoare logic, I don't mean 
all prostitutes like to watch Netflix, X is a prostitute, therefore X likes to watch Netflix. No, I mean whore logic in the sense that this is the logic that's invented by British computer scientist Tony Hoare, who in order to avoid a lot of manual subtitle fixes, I'm going to call Tony. The central part of whore logic, I mean Tony logic, is the Tony triple. This triple describes how execution of a piece of code changes the state. The form of a Tony triple is PCQ, where P is the precondition, that's basically the situation before you ran the code, C is the computation that you're performing, and Q is the post condition, which is basically the state after you've run that computation. In short, this means if the precondition is met, executing the command establishes the post condition. In a sense, you can view it as a very generic representation of a unit test. What you normally do in a unit test is you provide some kind of input value, you run your function, and then you verify that the output value is what you expect it to be. So that's basically one case. And with the whole logic, you can define let's say a range of cases using mathematical expressions. For example, you could prove that a program is correct for a certain input X uh, when X is between zero and 100 or something like that. The interesting thing about Tony logic is that they have rules for all of the commands that are available in structured programming. So assignment, if statements, loops, etc. So in principle, if you take let's say any imperative programming language, you could use whore logic to prove that the code is correct. At the time when whore logic was invented, that was at the end of the 60s, actually quite a few computer scientists believed that this was the way to go in order to make sure that you got correct high quality programs. Of course, nowadays we don't use logic to prove that our program is correct because that's just way too much work. Especially if code grows complex, you rely on lots of different libraries, it becomes really impractical to prove correctness of your program all the time. So what do we do? Well, we use unit tests and uh, other testing approaches that I'm going to talk about today to help us get a grasp on at least part of how our code works. So often when we talk about testing, people immediately think about unit tests because that's like the most straightforward way to start testing your code. Unit tests and any other testing approach where you run your code with a collection of predefined use cases, test cases is called dynamic testing. Another approach is static testing that doesn't require writing test cases, but involves things like code reviews and even syntax and type checking by your IDE. And then you have passive testing which doesn't even look at the code, but looks more at the side effects of the code. So log files that are being generated, databases that are being filled with data by the code. You can look at those things as well over time to see if there are any anomalies or strange things that you need to investigate. For example, suppose you develop an application for schools that has students and education programs, then what you could do as a kind of passive test is to check from time to time that students are always associated with at least one education program. Another way to look at testing is to differentiate between white box and black box testing. White box testing assumes knowledge about the inner workings of the code and black box testing doesn't. And unit tests, for example, are a good example of white box testing because you, you know what the function looked like, you know what the kind of inputs it expects and you can test those things. If you've done anything with testing, probably you started with writing those unit tests to cover those edge cases. But there are other things you can do as well. And maybe a not so common one that you haven't used before is mutation testing. And this is also quite interesting. What mutation testing does is that it slightly modifies the source code of your program, uh, basically introducing mutants. And see whether your tests pick these minor changes up. You could also see it as a kind of test for your unit test. It works pretty well for common off by one mistakes. For example, if you have a function that uses a for loop that accesses a list at index i minus one instead of index i, or uh, you let a loop run until i is less than n instead of i is less than equal to n, those kind of things. And what mutation tests 
often do is replace these operators less than, greater than by a slight variation of them, and then verify that the tests actually pick that up. There are libraries that can help you do these kind of mutation tests. Matmat is one of them. I will put a link to it in the description below. But let's do this manually and see what happens. So again, I'm going back to this add three function here. And now when I run the test, obviously, obviously they pass, but uh, let's say I would change this plus to a minus, like so. And then when I run it again, obviously the tests are going to fail. So in this case, the mutant that we created, which was the program, but with the plus replaced with a minus, resulted in the tests failing, which is a good thing. But let's look at another example. So I'll just change this back to a plus again. Let's say I'm adding another function that's called multiply by two, like so. And that gets an int and also returns an int. And that returns x times two, multiply by two. And now let me also add a test for this. So I'm expecting that when I multiply two by two, this equals four. So when I run this, obviously tests are going to pass because it's a pretty simple program. But now let's say I'm going to reduce some mutant here where I'm replacing the uh, multiplication by a plus sign like so. And now you see that the test still pass because x plus 2 happens to equal also x times 2. So here we found a mutant that apparently the test did not catch. And indeed, here this is just one test. If I, I would need to add more tests in order to make sure that uh, any errors are uh, going to appear when I test this program. So let's say I add another test here for the multiply by 2. And then we're going to do that for 3 and that equals obviously 6. So when I run this, now we're going to get an assertion error. And let's change this back to multiplication and then the tests are going to pass again. As opposed to white box testing, black box testing doesn't need to know anything about the internal working of the code. It looks at what the software does, not how it does it. An example of this is a testing technique called snapshot testing that's actually used a lot in web development nowadays. And that's technique where you take basically a snapshot of the state of the system before and after a command is executed. And then you can compare the two snapshot and see if there is any difference or anything that you need to investigate. If you build web applications, you can use snapshot testing to compare the HTML and CSS that your app produces and to make sure that things work as you expect them to. This is, for example, what React's just library does. While I was explaining the example, I talked about mutation testing. If you think of that in terms of Hoar logic, basically what you're doing is changing the C, the computation slightly, and then verify that given some precondition P that Q still is established. There's another important concept in determining program correctness, and that's the invariant. An invariant is a logical assertion that is always held to be true during a certain phase of computation. For example, you could define a loop invariant where uh, you specify that the index is never less than zero or something like this. And you can also apply the invariant idea to software testing, actually. What you could do, for example, is define a kind of property that you expect to be true and then test for the truthiness of that property in your test. And if you know that that property is true for a wide range of inputs, you can actually just generate a bunch of these inputs and verify that the property is true. This is a testing approach that's called property-based testing. There are libraries available in Python that help you do these property-based tests. Uh, one of them is Hypothesis. I'll put a link to that in the description below. I'll talk about Hypothesis in a separate video in more detail, but let's first look at a simple example of how property-based testing works. So now let's see how property-based testing in principle works in this same very simple example. So we have the add three function. I'm going to add another function here that's called remove three. Obviously that gets an int that also returns an int and that simply does x minus three. Still very basic, obviously. What you can do now is start testing properties. One example of property is that we know that if we have a number, we call add three and then we call remove three, 
we need to end up with that same number. That's a property of the combined calling of add3 and remove3. And you could do something like this in a simple unit test. So that would look like this. Let's say uh, add3, remove3, 4 equals 4, right? And then let's run this and this is going to pass. But now we're just testing one value. We're testing this property with one value. And actually, when you look at this particular test, the actual value we provided, we don't really care about it. We could pass it for a hundred or a thousand or a million or minus 23 or whatever. We don't care. We just want to verify that the property holds. So with unit tests, you provide a particular input and you measure what the output is and you verify that it is according to what you expect. With property-based testing, you're measuring whether a property holds and you don't really care that much about the value. And that's a difference between the two. So that also means that in property-based testing, you can actually run those tests with many values. For example, I could create here a for loop So now I'm running the same test, but I'm running it a hundred times. And still, of course, all the tests pass. But this allows me to do way more than just test a single input and output combination. It allows me to test specific properties. And that's why property-based testing is quite powerful. Another thing that's really nice about property-based testing is that with unit tests, as a developer, you're kind of responsible for determining what the inputs and the outputs are going to be that you're testing, because each case is basically a case that you test and that you have to define as a developer. Property-based testing allows you to do things with random numbers. So here I'm using a fixed X in the range of uh, 0 to 100, but of course you could also generate random numbers and then do it with that. That's add that simple example here. So I'm going to import random. And when I go back to my for loop, let's not use x anymore, but then I'm going to say x equals random. And then I want a random integer, let's say between a minus thousand and a thousand. So now I'm also testing with 100 numbers, but they're randomly generated. And this is nice because it means that potentially you might generate a case that you didn't think about as a developer. And that's why using randomized testing in these very specific cases is interesting. It's a, it's a nice addition to your regular unit test. I think you still need also unit tests to cover the cases that you are sure that you want to be tested. But these things help in kind of make the code and make your testing a bit more robust. This example of property-based testing where you're applying a transformation on a number and then applying the reverse and verifying that you get the original input is also called Bilbo testing or there and back again. But there are other things you can also do with property-based testing. Um, for example, uh, you can verify that something won't change. Let's say you're sorting a list. You don't expect the list to change its length. So you could create a property-based test that just generates a bunch of lists, sorts them, and then verifies at the end of each sorting operation that the length of the list is going to be the same. Another type of property-based tests that are also nice is uh, things that are hard to prove but easy to verify. For example, let's say you write a data processing function and that gives you a dictionary with fields and you just want to make sure that none of those fields are empty after you've called this function. And what you could do in this case, using property-based testing, is that, well, the property you're testing is that the dictionary won't contain any empty fields. So you just run the processing function on a bunch of random data, and then at the end, verify that the property holds. So they also see that properties are not exactly the same as invariants. Invariants describe things that don't change over the course of a certain piece of code. Properties can also only say something about the output, such as in the case that I just explained. So I've mainly talked about pretty low level white box testing techniques in this video. In the coming months, I'm going to explore libraries in Python that can help you set these things up and 
Also, look at all these different techniques in a bit more detail. Next to these lower level testing tools, there are also higher level testing processes such as integration testing, exception testing, and those also require a particular infrastructure such as a DTAP street. This stands for Development Testing Acceptance Production. I can talk about that stuff as well on the channel. Uh, let me know if you want to know more about this. Also, I'm curious, are you using unit test at the moment to test your code? And what about mutation testing or property-based testing? Let me know in the comments below. I hope this gives you an overview of the different types of testing systems there are and how that feeds back into the more generic idea of program correctness. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, consider subscribing to my channel so you don't miss anything. Thanks for watching, take care and see you next time.